If you gauge the status of small L liberalism by the popularity of the current Prime Minister of Canada, you'd probably conclude all is well. But outside our borders, the fortunes of liberal values, freedom of speech, universal human rights, equality of the genders, well, they've been on the defensive of late. Joining us now to consider how liberalism can weather these turbulent times, we are pleased to welcome back Michael Ignatieff, the former leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, now the rector and president of the Central European University in Budapest, Hungary. It's great to have you back here. Great to be here. In what was your studio once upon a time? Well, a long time, no. 1980s. 1980, you did a show here. Yes, I did uh, a show of documentaries. And uh, here you are I again. I owe TV Ontario everything. There we go. Well, I don't know about everything, but <laughs> maybe a little bit. You had, I do want to start off with this very interesting choice you've made because you had a terrific gig at Harvard University, uh, living in a great city, Boston. Where with you could, a great baseball team. I was just going to say, where you could go to as many Red Sox games as you want, and they're doing pretty well now, as you know. Now you decide to move to Budapest, Hungary. How come? Uh, well, it helps if you have a Hungarian wife. Hungary is a beautiful country with a beautiful language, but it's a language impossible to learn. It's like the north face of the Eiger. You can't get your hands on anything. So it helps to have a Hungarian wife. It helps to have a deep connection to Hungary, as I do. But the university is pretty special. Um, it was set up 25 years ago by George Soros, a Hungarian who made billions on Wall Street. Uh, and he wanted to set up a university that would defend liberal values, defend open society, defend free markets, free institutions, free minds, above all, free minds. And this university is now in its 25th year, and it has 1,000 students from all over the world, including 25 Canadians. Hmm. Um, it has an international faculty. It's a graduate university, and it's, crucially, it's in Hungary, which is a place that is democratic, but not liberal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've got a job of defending those values in a place where they're kind of shutting down. And that was too good a challenge to miss. I always like a challenge, and this is definitely a challenge. Even at the expense of missing some Red Sox playoff baseball. Well, I, you know, the internet is the internet, and I'm still, <laughs> still watching Pappy. <laughs> you're, you're in a bit of a tickle, at least I think you are in a bit of a ticklish spot. In so much as, on the one hand, there's George Soros and what he's done. On the other hand, is the current prime minister, and they're not getting along, and you're in the middle of all that. How are you negotiating that kind of complicated relationship right now? Well, I think that the first thing you have to do is understand what a university is. The university is not an opposition political party. It's not an NGO. It's not a campaigning organization. It's a place that trains free minds. And so we get the message over to the government that, you know, there'll be people in my university who don't like what the government's doing, and there'll be some people in my university who vote for what the government's doing. My job is to make sure that it's a free, safe space so people can say what the heck they want about the refugee issue, where the Hungarian government's taking a position that many people disagree with. Um, so, I am in the middle in the sense that hardly a day goes by without an attack on Mr. Soros, who was born in Hungary, who fled uh, during the horrendous uh, extermination of Hungarian Jewry and after 44-5. Uh, he's a Hungarian patriot. The thing that bugs me is that no one's done more for Hungary than George Soros, but there isn't a day when he isn't attacked by the government-inspired media. But for the moment, Steve, they draw a distinction between a free university, which is good for the city and good for the neighborhood, and Soros, whom they attack pretty strongly. And I'm trying to make sure that they understand that we're not the opposition to the government. We're just a university doing what universities have to do. So how safe a space is it for you at the moment? Uh, it's as safe a space as long as I stay smart politically and keep my people uh, understanding what, what, what to do. I mean, the, the, the point is universities, you know, the University of Toronto doesn't take a collective position on the Wynn government or on the Trudeau government or on the Harper government. It's not what universities do. So we're not going to do that in, uh, in Hungary. Hmm. The Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, uh, famously calls what you're living in now an illiberal democracy. What does he mean by that? Well, it's an interesting concept um, because he means it's majority rule without rule of law, without full freedom of the media, without independent ind institutions of the judiciary and the banking system. In other words, it's majority rule uh, dominated by a single party. That's illiberal democracy. And it teaches you something important about democracy that, you know, I think we're apt to forget, which is democracy is not just majority rule. 
It's also all these other institutions, like an independent judiciary, like a free press, that counterbalance the power of majorities. So, you know, what is, what is democracy? It's majority rule counterbalanced by minority rights protection. And it's the minority rights protection that are missing or are at risk of being lost in Hungary. He's developed a bit of a relationship with Russia's Putin. Uh, do you know what each of them want from each other at the moment? I think they want to embarrass the West. They want to poke the noses of NATO and the European Union. But let's also remember that, and because the anniversary is coming up, and many people watching this program will remember October 56 in Hungary when the Russian tanks, Soviet tanks, rolled into Budapest and shot the place up. And that is a bitter memory that Mr. Orban can't do anything to erase and Mr. Putin can't do anything to erase. So, yeah, they cozy up a little, but they're doing it really just to provoke the Americans and NATO. But in fact, Hungarians have a visceral uh, suspicion of a resurgent Russia, and they're right to do so. Um, Putin is not the Stalinist regime. Putin is not Brezhnev. But any Hungarian with a grain of common sense knows you don't want to get too cozy with Vladimir Putin. So Putin is or is not a kind of a role model for Orban? Well, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, yes and no. Yes in the sense of uh, majority rule through manipulated elections, single party dominance. That's what Russia would share in common with the Hungarian model. But it's also different. Uh, I think Hungary is, dare I say it, a freer place than Putin's Russia. Mm -hmm. I mean, one example, you know, there are no political killings in Hungary. Uh, government health warning, folks, I'm not here to defend Viktor Orban, the Hungarian government, it's not, not my job. I'm just trying to distinguish between regimes. I mean, people get killed in Russia for opposing that regime. They Journalist, don't get killed. Businessmen, everything. Yeah, they don't get killed in Hungary. And so it's important to notice that, you know, liberal democracy of the kind we have in Canada is being challenged all over the world in China, in Russia, in Hungary, a little bit in Poland, in lots of other places. But all of these challenges are slightly different, and it's important to remember that they are different. But all of them amount to kind of having democracy of a kind on the surface, but no substance of democracy beneath the surface. And it helps, I think, Canadians to understand that some of the most important parts of our democracy are the bits you don't see, like independent judges, judges who can't be turned around by money or political pressure, by media that allows you, know, you to do your job. Nobody's going to pick up the phone and ring you and tell you what you ought to say here. Um, uh, courts that do their job. Um, uh, regulators. Regulators, that's a completely invisible part of a democracy. People who regulate whether you can do business in this way or that. They can't, we have problems with corruption in this country, but they can't, they, they're not under domination of a, of a political party. These are the bits of democracy we kind of forget about. But when you go to a place like Hungary and you go to other places where those are the bits that have been weakened, you come back with a deeper understanding of what democracy has to be in order to work at all. And, you know, the other thing, I've just completed some research around the world. There isn't a country in the world where liberal democracy is not having a hard time. I mean, look at the United States. I love the United States because I, I love their baseball, I love their constitutional tradition. But, you know, do they have regulators that are not being corrupted by big money? Question. Do they have a fully free media? A question sometimes mm -hmm. when you look at Fox Media. Uh, are there courts and their police, above all their police, when you think about what is a democracy, it's a police force that will not arrest you or beat you up because of your race. That's democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, the United States right now, I'm not saying it's not a democracy, but I'm saying the struggle to preserve liberal democracy is a constant daily struggle, and we're seeing it south of the border, and we've got our challenges here. And, and net, what's the net story here? This stuff really matters. This stuff really matters. We've got to all be defenders of democracy, and the first lesson is know what the heck it is. If the U.S. is sort of story number one and all of what's happening in that presidential campaign in a liberal democracy, I'm guessing story number two over the past year was Brexit, and I want to ask mm -hmm. you about that. How concerned are you that that is sort of the first thread in the unraveling of the Europe that you know? I think everybody has to 
had serious concerns about that. Angela Merkel was in Bratislava at a recent EU summit. She said it's in crisis when a, not a founding member of the European Union, but a key member leaves and decides after a, a, a referendum vote, the majority of the people say they want out. That's a, that is a wake-up call if there ever was one. And they weren't there, were they, in Bratislava? No, Britain. no, no, no they, were, they were not there. Um, it's interesting. This this is a case where you know, <laughs> I don't need to tell this audience I've often been wrong in politics, but <clears throat> I was especially wrong over Brexit. I just thought they would remain, and I think the biggest shock about this was that when after the vote came in, they went north uh, to small industrial towns, Sunderland in northern England, which has received massive EU subsidy. They discovered that Sunderland voted for Brexit. That is, despite the fact that in some ways uh, membership in the European Union was good for some of these industrial towns, the majority of the population said it comes at too high a price. We've lost sovereignty. We've lost control. What's the larger message here? The larger message here is that sovereignty matters. Nations matter. Um, over economic interests in some respects. Over, indeed, over economic interests. You can say to someone, if you don't stay in this union, you're going to lose... Uh, you're going to suffer in your standard of living. People said, I'm already suffering. What, what could be worse here? What I care about is, is parliamentary sovereignty, democratic control, Britain for the British. And then we get to the darker side of this, which is the ways in which it's part of an exclusionary, anti-immigrant, anti-multiculturalism, anti, anti, in some cases, decency agenda. And all of this is a wake-up call for everybody. And it's a wake-up call for liberals because, and here's the, the point, we've taken for granted that our values, human rights, democracy, open borders, migration, multiculturalism, if we think they're good, they must be good for everybody. And there's a kind of liberal, sometimes a liberal arrogance here, uh, which gets us into trouble. Uh, we've all got to listen. Cosmopolitan. I'm a cosmopolitan. I've tr lived and traveled in lots of countries. Um, I feel at home in lots of places. Um, but that, that set of advantages makes it more difficult, not less difficult, to understand people for whom globalization is a threat, for whom you know, transnational trade pacts are a threat to their jobs. Um, and I think above all, uh, and, and this is even more difficult to say, um, People want control of their borders. Mm -hmm. They want to have a sense that when they vote, the votes they, uh, they take uh, determine what national policy is. The sense of losing democratic control of your country, the sense of losing control of your borders, just created a situation in which, in which Brexit won handily. And, and, and so I'm not, to your question, I'm not, I think the European Union will survive. But the question, the challenge that Brexit poses is, is once again to liberal democracy. Mm. Can liberals who believe in open borders and tolerance and multiculturalism develop a set of arguments that says to people who are frightened by globalization, look, we hear you. You want a country that controls its borders. You want a country that's sovereign over its national affairs. You want a country where you feel patriotic pride in your country's ac accomplishments. All that language has to be part of what a liberal, small l liberal, I'm Indeed. out of politics, no, we get small it. l we get liberal, it. what a small l liberal believes in. Sheldon, I'm going to pull an audible here. Let's go to the top of page three. This is board number two, and this is from Damon Linker of theweek.com from uh, a few days ago. Underlying liberal denigration of the new nationalism, he writes, the tendency of progressives to describe it as nothing but, quote, racism, Islamophobia, and xenophobia, is the desire to delegitimize any particularistic attachment or form of solidarity, be it national, linguistic, religious, territorial, or ethnic. The more this informs the political, moral, economic, and legal universalism spread around the globe, the more they inspire a reaction in the name of the opposite ideals. The Western world is living through just such a reaction right now. The question is, why are cultural and national identities proving themselves to be stronger and in some cases more important than economic interests than liberals expected? Great question. My, my sense is, though, that, that um, liberalism has always been a vision of political community. We've forgotten that. 
We've thought that liberalism is a kind of cosmopolitan ideal for everybody, but it actually, a democracy is a political community of people who recognize each other, whose whose emotions are triggered by, by things like the national anthem, by the sight of a maple leaf flag, by a, by a childhood memory of, of being up at the lake. All the things that make us Canadian are very emotional. Uh, I think sometimes liberalism with a small L has been a little indifferent to those emotions, but they're what binds communities together. And when, and when those emotions are denigrated, when those emotions are derided as being, you know, nationalistic, for example, uh, you can kick up a reaction that you shouldn't, you shouldn't be surprised by. Hmm. Nobody thinks of themselves as a European, do they? No. People think of themselves as Hungarian or British or French. Hmm. Um, and, you know, my, my sense here is that uh, um, racism, let's, let's be clear, racism is racism. And racism is ugly. And anti-Semitism is ugly. Uh, you can be against all of those things, and you should be viscerally against them. Um, but at the same time, you don't need to be against national pride. You don't need to be against the idea that no nation is going to survive unless it has control of its borders. You know, the, I, I don't agree with Mr. Orban's policies about refugees. I think Hungary should have taken people in. There are lots of generous Hungarians who are prepared to help, but he rolled up the razor wire. And he rolled up the Wazer Wire and has very substantial support in Hungary because he said a nation has to control its borders. Canada controls its borders. I came, I came through on, on, on uh, Tuesday night at Pearson. They give me a good check. They should give me a good check. Uh, they should give, you know, a country that doesn't have border control is not a country. And to some degree, uh, Merkel and uh, people whose politics I approve of were a little casual about that. They didn't realize how important that is to a sense of political community. Liberal, a liberalism that can't defend a political community, that is a community with borders, a community that says there are citizens in here and there are strangers without, is not going to be a community for long. So how big a challenge does what you've just described pose to the future of liberal democracies around the world? Well, it poses a big challenge if the consequence of what I'm saying is razor wire everywhere. Um, I've just been arguing uh, very strongly that the United States, for example, should be doing what Canada did and taking many more refugees in. I believe Europe should be taking in more refugees, partly for demographic replacement. I mean, partly just to keep the show on the road. We need new people. And anybody who's been to Canada knows that one of the chief sources of our dynamism has been regulated, lawful migration from every corner of the world. It's the best thing about this place. But it has to be regulated. It has to be controlled. You have to say, yes, you can come in. No, you can't. If you play with, if you don't play by the rules, you got to go out. All that basic stuff has to be part of what a liberal believes if we're going to hold populations through the experiment of multiculturalism. By experiment, I mean, let's remember, we didn't change the rules on Canadian immigration until 1965-6. It's in your lifetime and mine that this has happened. It's been one of the greatest things we've done, but you have to keep holding consent for it every step of the way, and, and consent depends on effective immigration control. I suspect one of the things affecting that consent is the fact that it's, this is not just a refugee crisis because of the numbers, but it's a refugee crisis because of where these people are from. Yes. The Muslim integration of Europe is not a completely happy story. And I wonder how you, again, small L liberals, compete with what is already a narrative that seems baked in. Yeah. Baked in, in a sense, if you're in Hungary, where I'm currently living, you know, Hungary for 400 years defined itself as the southern frontier of Christianity against Islam. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to change that. Budapest was occupied by the Turks. We have these beautiful Turkish baths in Budapest. You've got to see them. They're wonderful. But they're a symbol of Turkish domination of a Christian country. And all that stuff, when you say baked in, is what we're talking about. It's in the psyche of people. Blood it's, and belonging. Yeah, and it's, it's not in the psyche of Canadians. For Canadians, Islam is just another faith to be treated with respect, but not too much respect. I mean, you come in and... You know, we've had recent controversies about whether you can listen to music, and, you know, we've been pushing back and forward on that, as we should. It's, you know, it's, 
the, the majority in this country has a right to set and define the terms into which you integrate in this country. Same thing in, in, uh, in Europe. But it's, it's a more difficult struggle in Europe because the histories are different. The one thing I take away that has helped me with my small l liberalism is to give respect to the idea of different strokes for different folks. What works in Canada is not necessarily going to work in Poland, is not going to work in Hungary. Okay, because, but how different do you want the strokes to well, be, though? There's a limit, and that's human rights violation. And okay. there's no question that um, the ways in which immigrants have been treated on that southern border in Hungary are, are, are violative of human rights. Nobody can test the right of a state like Hungary or Poland or any of these countries to define who comes in and who doesn't. But there has been a, a way in which Hungary has refused any act of generosity and hospitality. Uh, and, and I think that's been damaging to the country. And the point, if I can just, I'm going on a bit here, see, but I'm, I'm, there's one point I want to make here. I use the word generosity and hospitality. The most successful refugee program in the world politically, that is the one that had the best support around the world, has been the Canadian one. And it depends on private sponsorship of, by, by families. Mm -hmm. It depends on the generosity of Canadian families and a one-to-one -one relationship between a Canadian family or a Canadian community and, and refugees. And that tells you something really important. It tells you as a liberal that liberals tend to think of this, whether a refugee has a right of asylum in a country, as a matter of rights. The Canadian story tells me something subtly but importantly different. It's a relationship of a gift, not a right. Hospitality is a gift. Canadian families are saying, come on in. We want to make you a gift of the most important public good there is in the world, namely life in this country. Yeah. But we are going to decide who comes in. And if you come in, you're going to shape up with Canadian values and, and the Canadian program. And that's been tremendously successful. The language of the gift turns out to be much more successful politically than the language of the right. And that's a huge and complex message for liberals. Does because that... we don't like the language of the gift, because mm -hmm. gift is discretionary. I'll take you, Steve, but I'm not going to take that guy. Mm -hmm. The language of the gift has all kinds of moral problems with it, but it turns out to be the language that moved Canadians to make this gesture that the whole world has taken notice of. I hear you, uh, and I don't want to get you mired in domestic Canadian politics today, but the reality is that, you know, the Conservative Party is having a leadership race right now, and one of the candidates, Kelly Leach, is essentially running on, I think, something very similar to what you just said, which is, we're going to screen you to make sure you, you, enhance, you embrace our Canadian values before we let you in. It I'm, sounded to me like you sort of said something like that just now. I, I'm not, I'm not going to be put in that box. Um, uh, I didn't mention screening. Uh, I was saying something very different. I think there are human rights, legitimate human rights limits on screening. Um, people should be assessed on the basis of need, on the basis of their identity, proving who they say they are. That is no fraud, no deception. But screening them for values, um, all, my, all my liberal hackles actually go up, and I don't want to enter it their leadership campaign, and I'm offshore now, and I, I don't want to go there. And I think I am saying something different. I'm saying that the, the, the thing that citizens insist upon in a liberal democracy is they have some say in who the gift is given to, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that the gift is a reciprocal relationship in which the person who's been accept, who accepts the gift accepts an obligation of some kind uh, to live by um, uh, Canadian norms. And 99.6% of the time, that's been the story of Canadian multiculturalism. And it, it's a, it's a sub, you know, my, my name is Ignatiev. How, you know, <laughs> how the heck did I get here? You know, I got here because the gift worked. We were given the gift and we've tried to repay it. You're on Twitter. And I follow you. Oh my God. And Haven't you got something better to do, Steve? Apparently not. <laughs> Here's, uh, in our last couple of minutes, I do want to, I, I'm not going to drag you into Canadian politics, as, as uh, you just mentioned. You keep saying you're not doing, but then and you go yet, ahead and do And it. yet, here comes the question. Uh, go ahead, Sheldon, let's put this up here. Here's a tweet from Michael Ignati, if not that long ago, when he said, Stephen Harper begins a new life after politics. Life's good after politics. I wish him well. My first thought when I saw that tweet was, that's a very classy thing for you to say 
about a man who basically spent millions of dollars trying to destroy your reputation during an election campaign in your own country. So am I allowed to call BS on that with you, Michael Ignatieff, and say you can't possibly really, really feel that way as you suggested in that tweet? Um, well, let me challenge you back. Uh, I got beat. I got beat by a pretty superb political tactician and strategist. Um, I didn't like Mr. Harper personally, um, but I respected him. I respected him as a political opponent. Um, whatever you think about him, and it'd be for Canadian historians to figure out his legacy, he was a pretty superb, ruthless, relentless political tactician. And uh, he beat me fair and square, or not so fair, not so square. That's but he beat, my point. But he beat me. But he beat me. And I just think it's... It's a bad thing in life and in politics uh, to brood and be grim and resentful. Uh, uh, I did that tweet not for Stephen Harper. I did that for myself. It's very important to put things behind you. Uh, it's very important not to carry uh, grudges. Um, I think that some of the things that he authorized to be said about me, uh, the problem is, some of the things he authorized to say about me lowered the tone of Canadian politics and set a bad example for the future of Canadian politics. But that, again, is for Canadian voters to, 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 to think about and reflect upon. Because uh, one of the things about liberal democracy is there ought to be some rules about what you say and what you don't say. There ought to be some rules to keep the conversation, the combat, the combat, because politics is combat, to keep the combat civil. One of the things that... Canadians, I think, are rightly proud of in our country is that the combat is pretty civil. And I think there were moments when Mr. Harper broke those rules. But, but, having said all that, uh, I think it's crucial in life um, not to hold grudges. And I, I do wish him well in the sense that uh, it's, an, it's an amazing accomplishment to be prime minister for 10 years. It's amazing accomplishment to take a party that's a kind of rag bag bunch of guys who aren't ready for prime time, and f wheeled them into a governing party. I also think, as a liberal, and we've been, as a capital L liberal this time for just a second, we've been in power for a lot of the country, a lot of the century, and, and we're in power now. But you don't have a healthy democracy unless you have a really vigorous, strong, competitive opposition. And he created a strong, competitive opposition, competitive enough to throw us out of office. All of that's an achievement. I don't like it because it came out of my hide. <laughs> yes, it did. But it's an achievement. And I think that you don't want to have... A, um, uh, if we're going to have civil politics, uh, let's be civil. We wish you well trying to uh, prevent Hungary from becoming a more illiberal democracy and uh, maybe nudging it a little more towards the liberal democracy that I know you wish it were and maybe still could be. Michael Ignatieff, great to see you again here at TVO. Thanks so much. Pleasure, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.